Hello everyone, and welcome to Grasping Reason, a channel about history, philosophy and art. This is the first video in a series on the pre-Socratic philosophers, and we start with the first pre-Socratic, Thales of Miletus. As the moniker suggests, Thales lived in an Ionian Greek settlement named Miletus, which lies on the western coast of the Anatolian Peninsula in modern-day Turkey. At the time he is seen to be active, roughly in the first couple of decades of the 6th century BCE, Miletus was known to be a very prosperous trade centre, with four magnificent harbours and a strongly defensible position, as well as a large number of its own colonies sending trade back to the markets of Miletus. We should perhaps not be surprised then that this wealthy maritime city was the home to someone often referred to as the first philosopher, in Thales. We'll see throughout this video that the city as a wide-reaching trade hub is important for understanding the work of Thales. Before I go on, however, it is important to note that we have no writings from Thales himself, and there is doubt over whether he wrote anything at all, but that doesn't stop him being seen as an important figure in the history of Greek philosophy. Thales, being present in the army, caused the river, which flowed down on the left hand of the army, to flow partly also on the right. We will look at the philosophical ideas ascribed to Thales shortly, but before we do, we'll go over a few of the feats that have also been attributed to him by ancient thinkers, the first being the quote from Herodotus I just read out to you. The fuller story is that when an army, of which Thales was a part, met a river with a strong current they could not cross it. By going upstream and digging a second route for the river behind the army, he was able to lessen the strength of, of the river ahead to the degree that it could be forded, an apt display of practical engineering ingenuity indeed. We hear also from many sources that Thales managed to predict a solar eclipse. This helps us give a concrete date to Thales' activities, as per Kirk, Raven and Schofield, modern calculations put it on 28th of May 585 BC. To be clear though, he would not have predicted a specific day, and Herodotus tells us the prediction was for an eclipse happening within that year. The final example I'll give is that Thales is said by Diogenes Laertius to have correctly measured the size of the pyramids by its shadow. Just how this was done is not explained, but by measuring the shadow at the time of day when Thales' own shadow correctly matched his height, that would give him a correct approximation. Through these examples, we can see that the reputation of Thales is founded upon diverse interests. He seems to be concerned with a range of practical applications of what we today call a scientific mind. Now, we shouldn't necessarily trust that all of the feats ascribed to him were actually his. Taking Herodotus as an example, he was writing at around 100 years after Thales lived, and that's not a good basis for historical accuracy. And that is without considering how reliable a historian Herodotus is. But what it does show is an effort to paint a man in Thales that can be considered a reliable source of information. Look at this man. He predicted an eclipse, and now also he tells you this or that. For the ancient biographers, this often seems far more important than accuracy. Before moving on, we should also point out that astronomical predictions were not new with Thales, but had a Babylonian history stretching much further back in time. Given the importance of Miletus as a major trading hub, we can assume that there was plenty of trade with Babylon, and perhaps this trivialises Thales' prediction. He asserted water to be the principle of all things, and that the world had life and was full of demons. If you have given a cursory glance at the history of Greek philosophy, you probably know Thales as the first philosopher, who suggested that water is the fundamental element in our world. There is a little more to Thales' thought than that, but it should be noted that we don't have too much to work from. Kirk, Raven and Schofield highlight two short passages from Aristotle's Decaeo and Metaphysics from which we get our understanding of Thales' musings about water. In summarising these two passages, it is noted that they assign two propositions to Thales. One, that the earth floats on water, like a piece of wood or something of the sort. And two, the principle of all things is water. To say the earth floats on water, we should understand first that the water is of an undefined quantity. We aren't given a way that the water exists under the earth, merely that it is present there. 
it isn't said to be resting on anything itself, and we can probably assume that this isn't considered. This also shouldn't be metaphorised in any way. We aren't given any evidence that Tailey saw this as a metaphor, and so we shouldn't put words in his mouth. What we should do, however, is recognise that this was not a new assertion with Tailey's. Again with Kirk Raymond and Schofield, they provide examples from Egyptian, Babylonian and Jewish mythological tradition that make a similar assertion, although with far more context than the brief mention of Thales by Aristotle. This they see as evidence that Thales' assertion is directly influenced by Near Eastern mythology, and that seems like a reasonable hypothesis. Again, we should acknowledge that Miletus was by no means an isolated Greek enclave, but was an important city within a semi-globalised ancient world. The transfer of ideas across the Milesian trade empire should certainly be expected. On the second of Thales' watery propositions, we may also see some similarities in mythologies, where water is the first element from which the land emerges. Here, again, Kirk, Raven and Schofield point to discussion of Okeanos as origin of all things, from Homer's Iliad. Yet, Aristotle tells us something more, that for Thales, water is primary in the sense that it is the true persistent nature of all things. He insinuates that, perhaps if we could strip a lump of earth, for example, into its constituent parts, that we should see that really it's just water. We don't know for certain how much of this is supposed to be fully stated by Thales, and how much is Aristotle attempting to understand a simple proposition of water as the principal element? Are we justified in inferring from the peripatetic identification of Thales' water as material principle that he believed the visible developed world to be water in some way? This is the normal interpretation of Thales, but it is important to realise that it rests ultimately on the Aristotelian formulation. If we had any surviving works from Thales himself, we may better understand what his own views on this were, but as we don't, we rely on Aristotle to guide us here. If Aristotle had more to work on, we might understand Thales in a different way. What we can say for certain about Thales' views on water is that we don't really know enough about them. Finally, in discussing Thales' philosophy, we can return to the quote by Diogenes Laertius that I gave earlier. It is said of Thales that he believed all things were in some way alive, and that there existed gods or demons in all, even inanimate things. Again, we have such limited mention of this that we can't truly unpack what this meant to Thales himself. What we can say, however, is that on the face of it, this sounds an awful lot like animism. Given the prehistoric emergence of animism as an idea and its almost ubiquity across the world, it would be folly to try and suggest a particular source for Taylor's ideas on this matter. And, given that we get so little information on Taylor's own views on this matter, it would perhaps also be folly to attribute the label animist to Taylor's at all. There could have been an intention to express another idea entirely with this principle, and unfortunately, we will now never know. I hope to have shown that what we know of Taylor's is incredibly limited, he may never have written a single book. The one book that some attribute to him is said by Diogenes Laertius to actually be the work of another. And yet, he seems to have captured the imaginations of those biographers and philosophers writing one to two hundred years later. We've seen that Aristotle gives us much of what we know of Thales' philosophy, but we should note that when Aristotle cites Thales, he does so somewhat cautiously, as if he doesn't want to commit to saying that these were actually Thales' ideas. So what can we truly say of Thales with such sparse information? Well, at the very least, we can say he was an important figure in the minds of the Greeks, that he was mentioned as a reputable thinker of his age, and the reputation of him at that time was as one of a philosopher, and perhaps the first. This is an image of the man that's carried through the ages, and Nietzsche gives us an appropriate summary in his philosophy in the tragic age of the Greeks. On the absurdity of water as principal element, he says, and this will be a long quote, so strap in, Is it really necessary for us to take serious notice of this proposition? It is, and for three reasons. First, because it tells something about the primal origin of all things. Second, because it does so in language devoid of image or fable. And finally, 
because contained in it, if only embryonically, is the thought, all things are one. The first reason still leaves Tailies in the company of the religious and the superstitious. The second takes him out of such company and shows him as a natural scientist. But the third makes him the first Greek philosopher. Now, we don't need to agree fully with Nietzsche's statement to recognise the main point to be made here. Because Thales is the first to be recognised as discussing the nature of the world without reference to myth, we can reliably call him the first philosopher, even if we're lacking the existence of real proof of that. It was that shift from the mythopoetic descriptions of the world that Thales has become known for throughout our history. The importance placed on him by his near contemporaries certainly shapes our perception of him today too, with his name being carried throughout the history of philosophy as the first of his kind. It is important to always recognise, however, that we have so little information regarding what his ideas actually were. So if you mentally categorise Thales as that guy who talked about water, I can't blame you. You'll need much more brain space to categorise pretty much any other philosopher. And if we were being honest with ourselves, there isn't much more that we know for certain. What the story of Thales should tell us, however, is that the history of ideas doesn't spring from nowhere. This story is not just about a man, but also about a city, to which prosperous trade carried goods and ideas. Thanks for watching this video, the first in a long series about pre-Socratic philosophy. Please help this new channel grow by subscribing, liking and leaving me a comment. Criticism is welcome, as long as it is constructive. I am completely new at this after all, and I will see you next time with a video about Anaximander, also of Miletus.